you had come across nasal breathing in 2005. So just a little bit about that. I'm intrigued. How did you become interested in breathing in and out through the nose? And was this during rest or sleep or exercise or all three? Well, uh, you know, actually, like a lot of people, I, I got interested in this because I was having lots of health problems from the time I was very young and, uh, you know, sort of explored the normal avenues with uh, physicians and things didn't seem to work for me. So lots of upper respiratory disease. I, I started year round swimming at six and water polo, you know, about 10. And uh, I was doing that all the way through college, started into triathlon about 1980. Uh, and I always had lots of uh, upper respiratory infection. Uh, once I moved to altitude out in the West uh, of the United States, um, uh, a large amount of sinus infections. And, you know, I, I probably, by the, by 2005, I'd probably had pneumonia 15 times in my life, 10 times, something like that, which is really extraordinary. Uh, and people think I'm exaggerating that because after a while, you stop actually even going to have it diagnosed. You just understand it. And, you know, you know, you got a couple of months, and you're going to have to work through it. Uh, and uh, uh, I was sitting at home one day. Uh, I was teaching here at this point in 2005. Had a sinus infection. You know, it was a nice day. I wanted to go out. Didn't feel like I really should. And so I sort of opened up my brain uh, and thought, well, you know, where do you go when you're getting out of the box? You go to the Internet. And I, I found this, this really interesting paper. And I don't know if you've ever run across this, Patrick. It was written by an engineer who coaches uh, – or at the time, anyways, coached uh, cross-country athletes in, in New Jersey. And he wrote the paper the way that an engineer writes a paper analytically, which has appealed to my brain, right? Uh, and he talked about two things, one of which I was already pretty well versed in, the idea of really not wearing shoes or wearing very, you know, wearing very, wearing very minimal shoes, which was the thing I had already been doing for a long time. Uh, and he talked about the idea of bringing nasally, which is the thing that had never even entered my consciousness while his athletes were running and he, you know, he talked about how valuable this was. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try that. Right. So, uh, so by the next day, uh, or as soon as I resolved whatever that sinus infection was at the time, I started doing my workouts, doing the portions that I could do nasally, which in the beginning was like nothing, right. I, I would start out on the treadmill in my warm up, which is what you might call progressive warm up, we increase in stages. And maybe I could do the first stage or so, and then I would feel that air hunger. I'd feel like, wow, I'm suffocating. So, you know, over time, though, within a week or two, I started realizing I could go a little further. Uh, and uh, then I would start, that, that got me to realize I was adapting to this. I have to mention that at the same time, the other thing I found on the internet uh, was the idea of using a neti pot, which is not a thing I was very familiar with either. And so I started doing that at the same time. I just started using one every day, not using one when I got sick, but just using one daily. Uh, and the result of this was that over about six months to a year, I fully adapted to breathing this way, both in cycling and running. I got to the point also by the end of that year in a corporate cup event we do every year where I actually did faster times breathing nasally on both a bike and in the run that I, a 5K run in a, uh, or I'm sorry, a mile run in that case, and a, uh, a 20K bike ride that I had done in the previous, all the previous iterations of that, which probably went back to about 1998 when I first started uh, teaching here. Uh, and so, you know, then I thought, okay, this is really working basically because I just stopped getting sick the way that I had in the past. So my initial impression was, well, this is training consistency, right? Uh, but, you know, later on, uh, as this really worked so well for me, and I started influencing students and athletes I was still coaching, et cetera, to try this. They had sort of similar results, and we ended up doing the study based on that, right, based on a lot of people who, who had chosen to go through an adaptive process over a period of years. And then we sort of uh, started to understand this was more than just training consistency being improved. It was probably something beyond that, and that's where this economy kind of idea came from. So, you know, I came to this naturally, and I'm, I'm, I was really interested in it because it really impacted me. And, you know, as a scientist – uh, we always talk about bias, right? And so you have to have concern when you look at science that I do about this bias, because I do, I did have personal benefits and I still have personal benefits. Uh, but also, uh, you know, people who are not involved directly in science sometimes think that scientists aren't biased. We all are, right? We call that the hypothesis, right? Uh, what we do is create uh, an approach to experimentation where we control for that bias so that that doesn't influence the outcome so I was pretty uh, circumspect about trying to make sure that the studies that we did uh, uh, removed the opportunity for bias to play a role. 
So I definitely have a bias, right? I absolutely believe this is useful. And I, to this day, still religiously, you know, breathe through my nose uh, when I'm training.